Good evening. My name is Scott Dodson and I'm the Executive Director of the Library of Virginia Foundation. Thank you for joining us tonight for this panel conversation with our amazing fiction finalists, Jocelyn Nicole Johnson, Joanna Pearson, and Sherry Reynolds, all moderated by past Literary Awards winner for fiction, Brian Castleberry. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to recognize the generosity of the donors who make the library's work possible. Most notably this evening, Amazon and Dominion Energy as the presenting sponsors of the 2022 Literary Awards. We sincerely appreciate all of the library's amazing supporters. Thank you. And now to introduce our moderator this evening. Brian Castleberry's debut novel, Nine Shiny Objects, was a New York Times editor's choice, long listed for the Penn Faulkner Award, and winner of the Library of Virginia Award in Fiction in 2021. He also has had his work published in Narrative, Southern Review, Literary Hub, Los Angeles Review of Books, Michigan Quarterly Review, and elsewhere. Brian currently teaches and directs the creative writing program at the College of William and Mary, and his second novel, Dream of Fire, Dream of Fire, will be out from Mariner Books in 2023. And now I'd like to welcome Brian Castleberry and our amazing fiction finalists. Thank you. Thanks so much, Scott. Um, and thanks to the Library of Virginia for all you do for uh, writers and readers all year long. Um, it's such an honor to introduce um, our finalists. Um, uh, first up, uh, Jocelyn Nicole Johnson, the author of My Monticello. Um, Jocelyn Nicole Johnson is the author of My Monticello, a fiction debut that was called a masterly feat by the New York Times and a winner of the Lillian Smith Book Award and the Weatherford Award for best books about Appalachia. Johnson's work was also a finalist for the Kirkus Fiction Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Leonard Award, and the Los Angeles Times Art Seidenbaum Award for First Fiction, as well as longlisted for a Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction and the Story Prize. Johnson has been a fellow at Tin House, Hedgebrook, and the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. Her writing has appeared in Guernica, The Guardian, Welly Jour Journal, Joyland, and elsewhere. Her short story, Control Negro, was anthologized in the Best American Short Stories, guest edited by Roxanne Gay, and read live by LeVar Burton, a veteran public school art teacher. Johnson lives and writes in Charlottesville, Virginia. Welcome, Johnson. Hi, hello. Hey. <laughs> Uh, next up is Joanna Pearson. Uh, Joanna Pearson's second collection of short stories, Now You Know It All, uh, was chosen by Edward P. Jones for the Drew Hines Literature Prize. Her first collection of stories, Every Human Love, was a finalist for the Shirley Jackson Awards, the Forward Indies Awards, and the Janet Heidinger Kafka Prize for Fiction. She holds an MFA in poetry from Johns Hopkins University Writing Seminars and an MD from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Pearson was born in Norfolk, Virginia, grew up in Western North Carolina, and now lives with her husband and two daughters near Chapel Hill, where she works as a psychiatrist. Welcome, Joanne. Thank you, glad to be here. And finally, um, Sherry Reynolds, author of The Tender Grave. Um, Barry Reynolds is the author of the novels Bitterroot Landing, The Rapture of Canaan, A Gracious Plenty, Firefly Cloak, The Sweet In Between, The Homespun Wisdom of Myrtle T. Crib, The Tender Grave, and the full length play Orabelle's Wheelbarrow. A graduate of Davidson College and Virginia Commonwealth University, Reynolds taught for 25 years at Old Dominion University in Norfolk before retiring in August. She currently serves as Cobb Chair of Humanities at Wolford College in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and divides her time between South Carolina and her home in Cape Charles on Virginia's Eastern Shore. Welcome, Chair. Hey, thank you. Uh, it's so great. To, it's, it's just really such an honor to be able to talk to, to all three of you. Um, these books are, are just incredible. I hope uh, everybody in the audience orders a copy or requests it from the library or both, maybe is even better. Um, uh, they're just, uh, all three of them struck me as incredibly timely. They all capture our region so well and with such clarity. Um, and they're all written by writers just at the top of their game. Um, I thought I'd, I'd start with a couple of rounds of questions for each author so they have a chance to kind of introduce their books uh, to the audience um, and to new readers. Um, 
And then we'll have kind of a round of general questions for everybody before we take questions from the audience. Um, so I'll start with uh, Sherry, I guess. Um, <laughs> Sherry, um, the Tender Grave uh, focuses mostly on two uh, characters, uh, half sisters, uh, Dory and Teresa. And I kind of wanted to talk about Dory first. Uh, when we meet Dory, she's um, running uh, from uh, she's running from the law. Really, she's running because uh, of a hate crime uh, that she participated in. Um, uh, she's in all kinds of other trouble, and she's trying to find this half sister of hers that she knows very little about um, so far. I thought maybe just to start us off, you could tell us a little bit about Dory and uh, her journey and where she comes from. Sure. Um, so Dory's a made up person made up of um, uh, people just like us. Um, who've, she's made a really bad choice. And so when this when the novel starts, she is on the run. She's in big trouble. She has done a terrible thing. And it was made up of a lot of little steps, right? Like there was one really big, bad action that came from a lot of really small choices that led her to that. And so she's desperate. She's she's totally desperate. And I didn't actually start out um, with with knowing that she'd committed a hate crime. What I started out with is um, is something that actually happened in my family that I totally fictionalized. And that is that maybe 12, 15 years ago, somebody kicked in my grandmama's door and did it multiple times, would kick in her door when she went to the chiropractor and steal her drugs. She was on painkillers and she was on, um, you know, psychotropic drugs and they would steal her drugs each time she would go to the chiropractor. And it became for me a really ethical problem. Like it really it got me because I loved my grandmama and I wanted to kill these people who kept breaking into her house. And so I started trying to explore that because I'm not somebody who believes that that's the right thing to do. But I was like, who is this that's breaking in? And my grandma would be like, this is just some poor old drug addict who can't help themselves. And so, you know, and I wanted to kill the poor old drug addict. And so I started, I kind of back up a lot when I'm creating characters and I was like, well, who else might this be? Why would somebody make a choice to break into an old lady's house and steal her meds? And so I ended up coming on this character of Dory, who was a desperate person. She's run away. She's trying not to get caught for this awful crime. She's looking for her half sister um, that she hopes will give her refuge, but she has not found her. She's running out of money. She has nowhere to go. And she, um, she's desperate. And so she's, she finds out about this old lady, she breaks into her house. And then that buys her just a little bit of time to start questioning her choices. So that's sort of where Dory came from. Um, she has committed a hate crime. It is clearly she's scapegoated a gay boy in her high school, but she really, um, she just needs somebody else to hate because she's got so much anger in her. And so that's the genesis of the character of Dory. Yeah, she's such an incredibly complex character. And uh, we do kind of watch that um, unraveling of, of everything yeah. she's built up that, that made her do this. Or... And it's the perfect challenge for a writer, right? To take somebody who does something despicable and then understand why and to even make you understand to, to say, well, this is bad. This is not OK in any way. And I feel for her. And if you can get there, then, I mean, that's that that's a starting point. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I guess that that leads to the to the um, to the other main character in, in the book, uh, the, the half sister, Teresa, um, in the second chapter, not to give too much away, but uh, they do meet up uh, pretty quickly in a pretty amazing scene um, uh, in which Dory is kind of just hauled in, basically, uh, to Teresa. Um, and uh, Teresa is also a, a really complicated individual. Um, there's there's a lot going on in her life. Um, she and her partner are uh, trying to get pregnant. Um, uh, her partner uh, runs a restaurant uh, there. Um, and uh, she has this really complex relationship with their mother, the, their, uh, this past relationship with the mother. And I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about Teresa, about that, those issues with the mom and Sure, sure. So, I mean, one of the things that I, I think of myself as a character driven 
writer for a fact. I'm interested in people and why they do what they do. But given that, this is one of my most, um, th this book has more drama than a lot of mine, uh, a lot more plot, starting with the hate crime. And then, of course, one of the issues is that, that Teresa is a lesbian. Her partner is a woman. And so this girl has run off looking for refuge, not realizing that the person that she's asking for help from is a lesbian. But the bigger issue is that Teresa um, and Jen are trying to have a baby and they have this idea of what a baby will be. And they, um, you know, she, uh, Dory shows up at like the, the time in their life when they are expecting that the child that they make will be um, special and beautiful and lovely. And here comes a child and one that needed them a long time ago. And she is not beautiful. And she is a picture of what they would not want their child to be. And so it creates that kind of tension. Um, Teresa was Teresa's mom um, ran away from that family and started a new family. That's why she has a half. That's why Dory has a half sister to run to that doesn't know her. And Teresa has always worried and wondered whether or not the mom left because she was gay. And she didn't even know that she was gay at the time the mom was there. But she knows that that wasn't accepted in the home, wasn't accepted in the religious beliefs that, that she was a part of, not accepted in the culture. And so she carries this idea that maybe the mom left her because she was gay. And um, and that is uh, a terrible kind of an abandonment. Right. And so um, so Teresa is also differently complex than um, than Dory. And that leads to the combustion that became the novel. Yeah. Yeah. That strikes me like that's kind of the machine of the novel. Once these two are together, like everything can can get moving. Quite an intersection with those two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, awesome. Uh, yeah. Let's uh, we'll move over, move over to Jocelyn. Um, I wanted to first talk about uh, the title story of My Monticello. It's kind of a novella. It's a really long, uh, really complex story um, that uh, that's about a, a group of people um, fleeing uh torch-wielding mobs, basically, uh, to, to hide out in Monticello, um, not to give too much of the, of the story away. Um, and I know that I, I'm sure that Virginians, um, you know, thinking about the recent past or thinking about the Unite the Right rally and everything that, that happened on that, that horrible day, um, did that inspire you? Did that, is that kind of where the story began or were you already kind of working on it? And then can you tell us more about the story in general? Yeah, I'm glad to. Thanks. Um, I wrote my Monticello, the novella. That's the biggest part of my collection by the same name. Uh, d definitely in response to August 11th and 12th here in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, when we were when this town was kind of the unwitting host to um, uh, a coalition of people coming under the banner of, of white supremacy, um, kind of ostensibly to protest the removal of some Confederate statues here, but really arriving um, with machine guns, with uh, banners of like past genocides, you know, saying things like um, into the ovens and Jews will not replace us and to holding torches, which, you know, recall kind of very violent times for, for uh, Black Americans and for other uh, ethnic and racial minorities in this country. And so I was teaching public school at the time. Uh, I live about a half mile from downtown Charlottesville, which was kind of the epicenter of the August 12th marches. And so I really spent a lot of time, I don't know, uh, for those of us who lived here, it was kind of like a slow motion crash. It wasn't just like one day people came and they acted really badly. It was like a whole summer of waiting for them to come and talking about what to do. And the Ku Klux Klan came as a precursor and, you know, all these other events were kind of happening. And so there was a lot of time to kind of ponder what to do. Uh, and ultimately I decided not to go to that rally, but it was an experience that I still had even from my home, um, the helicopter overhead, the pictures and images of family and friends, the news of what was happening. And then a young woman, Heather Heyer, was um, killed and 19 other people were battered by uh, one of the protesters running a car into a group of counter protesters. So, um, you know, I went back to school on Monday. Well, first of all, my son was 11 at the time. So there was a lot of how do I explain and contextualize this for him? Um, and then 
going back to my students, this diverse group of Charlottesville students and thinking, what does this mean and what should I do with it? And so I ended up writing, um, I did not have the idea for the novella before that, I wasn't writing that. But in the year that followed, one good thing that Charlottesville did was we talked a, a whole bunch about the history kind of the history of black people in this area. And that included things like um, kind of highlighting that there's a slave auction block on in front of like the, the um, town hall. Like there's, there's a plaque on the ground that this is where, you know, black Americans were auctioned off, you know, back in the day. And um, just kind of thinking about spaces and how they were segregated in the past, massive resistance in Charlottesville where the school shut down rather than open the doors to black children, shut down for all students for two years instead of opening the doors to black children. Um, and, and other things that I just hadn't really thought about, uh, even though I had some awareness of them, but just hadn't thought about in that intimate way. Um, the fact that UVA students brought their slaves to serve them at UVA. I mean, I knew that slaves had built some of that space, but I hadn't really thought about having a slave as a student. <laughs> Just hadn't thought about these things. And what that and one really interesting thing that happened was I actually was at an event and I saw um, a, a woman was introduced at the end of this event that had to do with Sally Hemings. And she was a descendant, a black descendant of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, a woman named Colleen Yates. And uh, I later, I say this all the time, but it was just really funny. I like saw her pumping gas like the next day. And I was like, okay, wow, she lives here. She's like a human person. <laughs> and there was something about that moment of seeing her um, that connected to me the past to the present, to the future. And the idea of my Monticello, the idea of the novella was for me to kind of wrestle with all the things that, um, were painful or angering or triggering or stressful or worrisome about the moment of, of, of these people deciding to march into town with torches and basically say, you aren't welcome here. This shouldn't feel like home to you. And what did I want to do with that? And how did I feel about Virginia as my home? Um, and how did I want to respond, not necessarily out yelling in the street, although I think that is... I don't know, I still can't tell you what, there's not one right response for any, I don't think. I think there are many ways we can respond, but for me, being the nerdy, introverted person I am, being the person, just being the person that I am, it made, you know, I often want to get my vengeance in fiction. So I thought, here's a space where I can like control the elements of what's happening and I can think about it and I can be layer and nuance it and be thoughtful about it. and put things, put contradictory things side by side and complicate everybody. Um, and for me, everybody was really looking at this diverse group of neighbors, um, mostly black, but not all black. And this diverse group of human beings that are responding to this, what they, what they experience as a violent mob coming into their neighborhood and starting to set it on fire. Um, and so those were the everybody that I wanted to think about. I wanted to think about this community and I ended up leading this, and you learned this very early in the first you know, bits of the story. Um, the person, this group flees in a jaunt bus. If you live in Charlottesville, you know what that is. And basically the person driving the bus, the person leading it is a uh, Denasia Love and she's a young descendant of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, like the woman I saw stand up. She's an actual person who goes to school here, who lived here, whose grandmother lives on the street next to where I'm sitting now on First Street and so forth. And so um, I wanted to think about those characters and how they might respond and all the feelings they might have and all the complications they might have and how they might mount um, a kind of resistance in their community and their female power and their growing things on Monticello and them reclaiming the past and all the things that they try to do in that space. Yeah, yeah, she's an amazing character. It's just loaded with uh, just such such vivid characters, um, and it's a it's a really cinematic story. I mean, I just was just pulled right into it. Um, it's a, it's so incredibly compelling. Um, there's there, there's other great stories in in the collection too that I I was especially impressed by for kind of their formal experimentation. Like there's um, the the story we mentioned before in your intro, um, Control Negro is is uh, posed as uh, a letter uh, from this uh, father uh, explaining basically the scientific experiment that was um, the son. Um, uh, that story, and then also the story uh, buying a house at the 
ahead of the apocalypse. Buy yeah. a pop ahead of the apocalypse. Yeah, that one's this um, uh, kind of uh, posed to us as like a set of instructions, but it's also about kind of our uh, collective fears about everything that's going on around us. Uh, this sense of kind of chaos and, and losing control that it feels like maybe a lot of the 21st century is. I don't, I don't know about <laughs> you all, but. Um, could you talk about those those other stories in the collection? Sure. Um, I um, so for Control Negro, that was actually another story that was a direct response to something kind of like the rip, the literary version of ripped out of the headlines um, here in Charlottesville uh, in 2015. An honor student, a black honor student at uh, University of Virginia, was bloodied by uniformed officers, kind of on the strip. Um, a young man named Martise Johnson, and it was caught on videotape and there was a response and there was a lawsuit and there was, there was a lot of things that happened in response to this. Um, and I was thinking about, um, even when I entered, when I talk about that story, he wasn't honor student, he was a black student, but putting black honor student side by side is, is this way that I'm, uh, protecting him or showing that he has value. Right. Um, he, he's, he was, he was an honor student. He was a good person. And the story is kind of about, that it's about how good, how docile, how great, how presentable, how whatever. What are how, what does it take for um, black and brown people to be safe uh, in America, or to have more than be safe to have um, access to this promise of life and liberty for all and justice for all? And so um, the story is just kind of very twisted version of thinking about that. It's a uh, this father is is basically creating an experiment on his son. Uh, the son does not know it to compare his son to ACMs, um, American Caucasian males, these other students, and see if the son is good enough. Can he also have access to this, the privilege of this safety of a reasonable response when you do something uh, wrong, or if you do nothing wrong, can you be safe? And so that's what I was thinking about in that. And I love playing with forms. One thing I love about short story collections in particular is that every story can have its own point of view and you can look at something from a lot of different directions. And so in that story, it's a letter. And then uh, Buying a House Ahead of the Apocalypse, um, the other story, which is the sh really short story, it's in a bulleted list form. I'm a compulsive list maker. Um, I tried to write that story a couple ways. And then once I found the list, I was like, this is the way that I want to make this story work. And it really suits me. Um, and it's kind of someone uh, thinking about all their fears, like the world's falling apart, but they still kind of want a house. And then, you know, they're, they're contemplating side by side, like how will they have safety for their daughter when the, you know, the hordes come outside, but also like what's their apocalyptic hairdo as a black woman. And like, you know, there's a, there's some humor in it. There's some, um, and because it's bullets, you can have something funny right next to something that's not funny, or that's what I at least intended or hoped to do in that story. And just to think about this kind of moment that we're in. And that story was actually written before the pandemic in 2019. Uh, but it has a lot of that pandemic feeling in it, because I think we all were already, that, those were my fears, we're already in a space of worry about um, how we treat one another, and, and in particular, how we're treating our home planet uh, uh, with climate crisis and so forth. So those are, are all woven into all the stories and, and those two in particular, those three really in particular. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember uh, reading that one and, and immediately thinking of my students um, because they're always looking for stories like that, that take on new forms that like borrow forms. Um, there's a lot of gravitation towards that kind of second person thing that my students just really dig. So um, I was excited. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to jump over to Joanna. There's kind of a connection with what um, Jocelyn was just talking about with that, um, you know, pre-COVID uh, feeling of like that, that already feeling like we were um, kind of uh, looking over a precipice in a way uh, of, of things. Um, uh, that, that kind of uh, reminds me of, of your story writing um, from the mm -hmm. collection, um, because it is set in, in, in COVID times, it seems like it's probably set in like the first year of COVID when it, it was especially, uh, especially a sense of like, we didn't know what was going to happen next or how we should behave. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty and fear. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that story? What inspired it? It seems to have some Red Riding Hood connections as well. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Um, 
It it was definitely written in the as you have rightly guessed. It was written in the early, early and maybe most uncertain feeling time of the of the COVID pandemic. I I think, and you're also right about the the sort of superimposition of the fairy tale structure, which um, I don't know. I find it incredibly rich. I think that often we come to narrative as a way of displacing our greatest fears on onto something else. I think often um, fairy tales or, or spooky stories or you know, often what we're really talking about is, is just over here, but we can only kind of approach it obliquely. And so I think in a way, uh, revisiting that sort of fairy tale structure felt like a really natural fit. And then I, I think in a way, I can only kind of return to it as a reader now when I return to it as a reader, I definitely have the feeling of, oh, well, this was clearly composed by somebody living through the early COVID pandemic. But in a way, the story feels sort of um, one step outside of time. I don't know that when I when I come to it as a reader now, I I I don't know that um, it exactly feels quite like it was set in in our 2020 our COVID pandemic. But it's definitely set during a pandemic and a in a time of um, of of uncertainty, um, yeah, and uh, and and I just I, I really enjoy um, in general stories where there are these um, layers or ways that things are kind of refracting off of one another, and so I think that maybe is also why I was drawn to kind of weaving those those uh, threads together. Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely has kind of a. Uh, that that Shirley Jackson kind of vibe where you don't you can't tell when or where what world we're in but it feels kind of like ours just a little creepier. Um, yes, yes, I I I am complimented and also agree. I feel like it does sort of feel a little Shirley Jackson ish. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember um, when I was reading it when the uh, when the kids start putting on the wolf masks. I was just I almost needed to take a break. There was something just a little <laughs> too terrifying about that moment. Um, uh, there's another story in the collection too that, that uh, field glasses that starts with a lot of fear and uncertainty um, and then I think maybe another connection or, or thematic connection that I, that I saw in some of the stories were um, uh, I, I guess often uh, young people who are, are dealing with some kind of relationship that they don't understand like maybe they're too young to really get like what kind of mess they're getting themselves into or what kind of decisions they're making um, I'm thinking of the, uh, the the first story in the collection, Rome, um, yeah. and then just a couple stories up in the table of contents, the story called The Whaler's Wife, um, yeah. both have young female leads. Yeah, yeah I think, I, you know, it, it has to have something to do with, at least I, I think there is that sort of eternal appeal of, of the coming of age story to speak the most generally, but maybe what that really is about is that it's a threshold story. I mean, I think a lot of a lot of stories, if you go even broader, you're thinking about what is often most interesting is you're capturing a person on the brink of something. They're about to cross a threshold into into something else. Um, yeah, and again, I think it, maybe it's it's a similar thing that I'm attracted to of people who there there is a certain amount of youth or naivete but there's also this real craving for for the world and its richness and its and its scariness and you know being a part of interesting things um the story you referred to the whaler's wife is about a a young college student who travels to um, boston and she's she's doing a volunteer program and staying with a in her mind, a very fancy, educated family. And all this is incredibly attractive to her because she's from a small town in the South and um, she sort of is, is, is attracted to this, but also put off by it. And then the rumor amongst the other volunteers is, oh, well, you're staying at the, the house where, the, where the, the husband was a murderer. You're, you're staying in the house where you know the, a murder happened. And, and again, I think this is this, interesting thing about storytelling in general, but also to me, sometimes the short stories I'm most interested in where 
a character can be constructing a narrative to try and make sense of a situation, but then you as the reader are getting other threads that make you say, well, is this actually, like, is she bearing witness to a, a, a marriage that's had a very um, traumatic blow that's happened to it? But like, did a murder actually happen? You know, may, Maybe not. Um, but I, I'm really interested in that kind of um, buildup of tension where you, people are kind of approaching this, these situations and not fully understanding and sort of wanting to partake and kind of make a story that makes it make sense to them. But <laughs> are they always so successful? That, that's part of where it gets interesting, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, um, to, to, and I guess that's something we do anyway, right? As we as we approach things in our own lives, we we'd make up these stories and narratives that uh, we try to see if they fit for a while. And, yeah, um, it struck me that yeah, especially those two characters, those two stories, those characters yeah. are kind of in that boat. Um, yeah. Well, great. I want to hit some kind of more general questions. Um, maybe like a softball kind of question to start off with. Um, uh, what got you all writing? Um, did a particular author or teacher or family member or friend inspire you? And I don't know who to start with. <laughs> I've been writing always. I mean, I before I could make letters, I was writing. I just, it was sort of innate. I, I wrote about things that I didn't know anything about. I, I would write about things I wanted to know about or things that I thought were special. I people who had bigger, better lives, people who had very different lives. Um, I didn't know any Jewish people. I wrote many, many Jewish stories because, and, and I had never flown on an airplane and I wrote lots of airplane stories because it was just how I explored things. But I didn't really think about doing it in any sort of professional way um, until I was a bad chemistry major in college and it wasn't going well for me. And in my spare time, I just wanted to write stories and some folks from the English department um, sort of started saying, come on, come on. And that sort of was my way in. Lee Smith was a really big influence on me. Um, she was, she came to Davidson College to, um, to judge one of the writing awards at Davidson and I won it. And so that part of my, my award was that I got to hang out with Lee and she said, well, what are you going to do after you graduate? And I'm like, I don't know. And she's like, well, why don't you move to Richmond? Because I'm going to start teaching in an MFA program and maybe you should apply to that program. And that was, I didn't know what an MFA program was, but I didn't have any plans. And VCU offered me um, a stipend, a teaching fellowship and a stipend. And off I went. And that was how that, that happened for me. And that was, my my formal training mm -hmm. yeah we're both uh we both come out of the vcu mfa yeah. program then yeah um that's that's awesome it's it's funny how oftentimes we just kind of stumble into this i feel like right as like writers. our characters right i mean i was yeah. just saying earlier it's just like one step and then another little step and then another little step and you've done something awful right and and so sometimes it goes the other way one little step and another step and you do something that really works so yeah 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 jocelyn what got you started I love I love um, Sherry how you said you were writing to figure out things or to go places you hadn't been. Often I do that as well. I think about a question that I have or a, a, something that's un it's not like I'm writing to tell you what I think about it. I'm writing to figure out what I think about it or how it should be constructed. Um, I also was writing um, and drawing a lot when I was a kid and. Luckily, I've gotten rid of these things, but singing, dancing, I was very um, <laughs> expressive. <laughs> I would do solo dances in the talent show of modern dance. I don't, I'm not really good at these things, but I was really, really an expressive kid. And so, um, you know, I have my fourth grade novel that we had to write called Prom Queen that I was just looking at the other day. Uh, I went to um, UVA's Young Writers Workshop when I was 16 or 17, which was the first time I went, you know, that it was held on campus then. Now I think it's on Sweetbriar's campus. It's still going on. Uh, but it was the first time I had like almost like a mini MFA kind of experience, just in the sense that we read each other's work with that much care and our teacher's talked about our work with that much care. And I took this micro fiction class. And I remember that, I think that still is evident, that idea of having someone very early on talk about pruning down to where every word carries weight or something that's just so slight and concise, but maybe hopefully shows you a bigger world or refracts or reflects something else. Um, so those were formative things. I 
I just gave a talk to some high school students that read as a community read my Monticello. And I was talking about um, S.C. Hinton and the Outsiders and how I'd writ read that in middle school. And I learned that Hinton had written that book um, when she was a teenager and published it when she was a teenager. And I actually did write a novel uh, after a trip to San Francisco as a teenager um, uh, and uh which I still have copies of, and I actually rewrote as 30 year old. But at any rate, um, that was really formative too. just seeing a model of someone. I think there's so much power in seeing someone that for whatever reason, you identify with them in some way. In this case, it was because she was so young. And I love the idea of outsider characters in general. And so I think that also was a big push towards it. I ended up being a public school teacher, I kind of went on the art track. And I you know, taught visual arts for many, many years, but I just kind of kept writing on the side, writing in the summer, taking workshops as I got a little bit older, I kind of, you know, would apply to Ten House or apply just, you know, every summer I try to go do something. And uh, so that was my, um, my formal piecemeal quilted together <laughs> education and just slowly over time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned uh, The Outsiders and Essie Hinton. I'm, I'm originally from Oklahoma. And so The Outsiders, you know, it's like The Outsiders and Invisible Man and the Bible are kind of like the, <laughs> the best books in the universe if you're from Oklahoma for quite a while. Um, that's that's great. Um, uh, Joanna, what, what got you started? You know, same as, as Sherry and Jocelyn, it was a thing that I was drawn to from a very young age of filling up little notebooks with uh, stories and poems and um, you know whatever. I, I was I was less of a dancer, but I, I like that. I like that detail, Jocelyn. Um, but I had uh, lots and lots of notebooks, and it was just always the thing that that I gravitated to in school. And then when I got to college, um, I took some writing classes, and then you know honestly by no other reason really than the pressure of my schedule and getting the classes I needed to take, I sort of got funneled into the poetry uh, track. Um, and, and again, at that point I was sort of like, all right, whatever, it's all fun to me. Um, and so once once it kind of worked out that that was a class that, that fit my schedule, I sort of completed that, that track in college. And so then I think for a long time, especially as I was, doing other pretty like time consuming things like eventually medical school and resident like it it felt like um felt like I had sort of maybe missed the boat and never developed any skills as a fiction writer even though it was still something I mean the true test is what are you reading the most of and if I'm perfectly honest with all of y'all I never read the amount of poetry that that I was always reading you know sh short stories I always loved novels I loved um, and so I, I still wanted to you know, keep my hand going. I did, um, like Sherry, I got some funding to do an MFA in, in between medical school. So I did it, but it was in poetry again, because that was where I felt like I had the, the confidence and the, you know, the material to show. Um, and then really relatively late, it, it was only after the birth of my older daughter, who's, who's eight um, and it certainly wasn't immediately after she was born because I couldn't think a thought in the first couple of months. Um, but at some point after she was born, I, I kind of was like, I'm hanging up my poetry jersey. I'm done with this. It's uh, and I just wrote a short story um, and it felt really good and I liked it. And I thought maybe even if maybe I don't know what I'm doing, maybe I'm relying on intuition and a lot of reading, but I'm going to. I'm going to keep doing that. And that's sort of how I, I jumped in um, and have been going ever since. And I have, oh my gosh, there's, it, I can't even get started on writers I've read who've been important to me because I, I feel like then I kind of, I just keep going. I go down the rabbit hole of, of listing people uh, whose work has, has really mattered to me, but um, yeah, that's, that's how it happened. Yeah. Do you do you feel like your um, your background in um, uh, medical school and psychiatry is that does that influence your work? Do you feel like these things work together in your creative process? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I think I think they have to. I mean, part of me thinks that 
everything one does has to in that way that we're always, you know, metabolizing whatever, be it the, you know, whatever our day to day is. And I think, I think in a way, the stuff of work and dailiness probably ought to be incorporated into writing all the more. But um, yeah, I, I absolutely think it does. And I think part of that may be the fact that a lot of what people I'm seeing in my day job are doing is in a sense, they're, they're constructing narratives often. I mean, they're, they're sort of trying to make sense of things um, by finding a narrative that resonates for them, or in the case of, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, perhaps they're, they're challenging certain narratives that are unhelpful and overly influenced by lots of negative self-talk and, and, and kind of stepping back and, and being more aware of the narratives that they're building to, to understand themselves and their relation to the, to the world. Um, the one thing I always say, because I personally feel like I would be a little bit creeped out if, if my primary, my therapist, my, like, you know, my whoever, I wouldn't necessarily be like, oh, hurrah, my gynecologist is a right. You know, I, I, so I always feel like I, I have to be really clear that while it all gets metabolized and I know it's stirring up stuff and you could certainly glean, I think, from the stories that I have an interest in, you know, the ways that we're all affected. All of us, I think, are affected by, by mental, emotional distress, turmoil, um, you know, all of it. I will say I never lift and fictionalize things that people tell me in, in the in the room. Even if I could do it legally, I feel like I would feel really icky about it. So I uh, I have to throw that out there. But they they definitely relate. They definitely relate. Yeah, yeah. How about uh, you, Jocelyn? You uh, you teach art and um, uh, I guess probably make some visual art. Do you feel like uh, that side of your life is part of your process as a writer too? Is there kind of some bleeding back and forth? Yeah, I definitely think, well, I'm, I'm not teaching anymore since the pandemic um, and the book came out, but I taught for 20 years and what I, I would definitely say the particularly the being a public school teacher, being in a public space with just like all the kids, right? You just have like, they just come with their humanity. They're just, you just see, I mean, any ideas you have about how a person is, and then you just are confronted with your class. It's like that this time of year, you know, you have a fantasy in your mind of what it's going to look like, and then they just come and they're human beings. And you just, you're like, that is what it is. And I love that. I really enjoy that. And I think that's just general fuel for fiction because you're just in constant, um, interaction with people and with families and you see other colleagues and you just hear voices. And I will say, um, I will also say like Joanne, I don't take a kid, you know, I have a story with kids in it and those aren't kids that I had, but it's more like just the kinds of things you see and the kinds of energies you see and the kinds of conflicts you see give you, you fuel for things and just names and how things sound and just being a person yeah. in the world. Um, and I think for me, I also, um, with visual art, teaching visual art, just the ideas of it, how I, what I would tell my students about presenting themselves um, and what's hard to do as an individual, you know, it's very, it can be very vulnerable, at least for me, I'll speak for myself. It can be very vulnerable to write something and then you spend all this time and energy trying to put in the world and then it's kind of terrifying it when it is in the world because <laughs> your insides are on the outsides or this part of you or this thing you made is now out there for other people to experience and to have their own ideas opinions thoughts interactions with um and so uh but i use kind of how i would the kind of teacher I would be and what I would say to students to, to like self-talk myself off the ledge and just to try to have the experience of recognizing if you make things, that's part of the process and that's not what you should focus on and worry about. And what you have to think about is yourself as a maker and what's interesting and where your mind, you need, there's just ways that you interact with your work that I think it's easier to say to someone than to do, but because I've had to say it for like 20 years to really cute little kids, I can like... <laughs> pull on that to help myself, you know, try to be a more sane human being. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's hard to practice what you preach on that front. I, I'm, I know from experience myself, uh, I really like what you said about, um, 
yeah, just the the interaction of uh, the the classroom being just it's a, it's such an important. I feel like it just opens you up as a person. You meet so many different people and uh, and their ways of life, and and you you have to open up to them and uh, and and meet them where they are. And uh, that's uh, yeah, that seems incredibly helpful for writers. Um, uh, Sherry, I wanted to ask you about um, uh, the Eastern Shore because I just. Uh, I just love the Eastern shore. Uh, we try to get out to the Eastern shore as often as we can. Um, it's just such a beautiful and quiet place. Um, uh, has that place inspired your work? Do you feel oh, like? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was, um, I have two main landscapes. I think that I can see that I, that I write about one of them is my childhood landscape and that's South Carolina and rural South Carolina rivers, farmland, tobacco farms, the smells that, you know, that, that, that really rich, um, poor people in a beautiful, um, you know, natural world. But the other one has been, um, Cape, uh, Cape Charles. I don't use it. I don't, I don't set things in that landscape. I don't call it Cape Charles because I want to take the fictional liberties, but the Eastern shore as a, as a place has been so, um, it's, it's felt like such a home to me. It's a, um, it's such a small place. It's such a beautiful place, but the people are in each other's business so much and know everything about <laughs> each other. It's also when you cross that bridge over to the Eastern shore, it's like you back up in time, you know, it's, it's another, um, uh, and, and in all the wonderful ways and the bad ways, um, when you, when you back up in time there. So my last three books have been set in, um, well, on the Eastern shore and in a fictionalized Cape Charles, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it definitely infused my work more than I guess any other landscape has. Yeah. yeah. I definitely, uh, when Dory's trying to hide in the water and the water is uh, not deep enough to actually hide in, I thought, wow, that's Cape Charles. Right yeah. There. Yeah. I use the landscape um, very, um, I, I use it a lot. I just don't call it the name of the town because, you know, there are things that I want to do. Like in that book, um, my characters, um, Teresa and Jen, they live in a repurposed um, hotel motel near the water. And mm -hmm. I need that. that it, it works for the book. But there is no way that the zoning board in Cape Charles would ever <laughs> allow um, people to do what they've done there. And I want the ability to um, to create that. And at the same time, I want to use that really um, that that very eerie kind of haunting um, abandoned ferry dock that is there that is that is an actual place in Cape Charles where I play story and let her hide for a little while. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, your, your process. I guess we kind of touched on some of this. I wanted to talk to all of you about, um, yeah, like uh, how you approach writing. Are you one of those writers that gets up at 5 a.m. and does the whole Toni Morrison right before the kids are up uh, approach? Do you write in the evenings? You write kind of piecemeal. Um, yeah, how do you approach your, your craft? Um, maybe uh, Jocelyn first and, and then kind of work around. Yeah, so for me, it's changed. I wrote this collection while teaching full time between 2015 and 2019, 2020 with the final edits. And so a lot of writing, I'm actually frankly, impressed that I did get so much <laughs> writing done. Like um, I wrote in the summer, I always would go to a workshop. I, in later years would try to go somewhere where it wasn't a workshop because it's hard to get writing done at a workshop because you're really social, you know, you're talking about other people's work, you're listening to people, you're getting really inspired, but there's not a lot of time to actually write. So doing things like BCCA, you know, I had, my son was, you know, eight to, to, 15-ish during that top 14-ish during that time. So thinking about um, it's hard to take space, I think, as a parent and a particularly as a mother, at least in the way many families are configured, including mine. Uh, so, but in the summer, you know, I could send him to camp and get quite a bit of writing done. Uh, I think part of the reason I'm partial to short forms is because I can draft a whole draft of something. You know, I've written novels before and it's 
it's hard for me to keep everything in my mind. I think even as I, if I approach a novel, I have to kind of break it down in this way, or I have to, with the novella, I kept telling myself it was a shorter short story and then it kept getting longer. And I just kept saying, well, it's not a novel, it's a novella. It's a, it's a short story that just is like a little bit bigger. And it is, I mean, there are things about it that are short story like, but it's also just like a way to think about how to put things together, or how to form them or how to put them in these little spaces so that you can work at it. Now I try to work in the mornings um, before I get much else done. But I have to say, I think that the last few years have kind of broken my brain a little bit and it's hard for me to focus for a really long time. So one of my challenges is thinking about how to make that part of the form or how to have burst of things that could fit together. And maybe that's the kind of work. I think you're a human being and you have to take wherever you are and find a way to make work that comes out of that. You know, I had, so I think often the work, the shape of the work comes out of like where you are and how you are and how your mind is working. And I think we all have a kind of a friend can have a very frenetic or distracted or scroll through sense of time sometimes, even if it's not the healthiest way to be and how can that be reflected uh, in the fiction that we read. So that's what I'm doing now. Yeah, I like that idea of um, kind of listening to yourself, right? Like listening to what what you can do right now or, or how your mind is working at the moment um, to approach your craft. Because um, yeah, I, I do feel like sometimes writers, you know, keep forcing themselves to, to do one way or another and don't, yeah, follow what they actually need to do. That's really cool. Um, let's see, uh, Joanna and then Sherry, what's your approach? Um, to yeah, I feel a lot of uh, kinship with what what Jocelyn was saying. I, I, I don't know, I never know, once I've written something, I never know how I actually was able to write it because I have all the the bad habits of a former poet. And, and again, maybe this is that sort of what you're able to write there's a sort of unit that grows out of whatever interstitial time you have available to you and so maybe maybe i've moved up from you know during my residency training i could only write a sonnet you know and now i've moved up to a a short story but i i don't have i've i've not been able to find a a regular writing habit to my uh to my sadness um, but I will say I get a really powerful, I don't know what else to call it, like a, like an existential malaise. Like I, I feel, I feel a kind of like soul sickness. If I don't, if I'm not working on something, I feel so much better if I, if I have something that I want to sink my teeth into. And somehow once I've got my, my teeth sunk into something, somehow there there suddenly I'm finding time available for that but it's it's the kind of like when I'm not uh when I'm not in it that um that that it's hard and and I guess in fairness too one thing that I am you know I'm always a little bit I, I love the idea of like an academic calendar so I do wish that I had more of the like the summer flexibility but I also think like you know we, there's there. <laughs> People have been fitting in writing in between all sorts of stuff for as long as uh, you know we can remember. So there must be a way to 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 do it. Um, so that's my like non non process process. <laughs> I feel you on the the existential dread sensation. <laughs> when you're, not, you're not working. That's. that's it feels so weird. bad. It feels so, it feels so much better when you can if you can get a foothold and and mm. get like a little bit into something and get some momentum it feels so much better. Yeah. I understand that too. I used to worry about it a lot because I actually don't write all that much. When I'm in a season, I'm a mad woman writing, yeah. but I have long spaces between my seasons. And yeah. I used to feel like there was something wrong with me and I wasn't doing my work. And now I just, you know, just sort of embrace the fact that most days I don't have anything to say, but that doesn't mean I won't. It just means that yeah. I don't have anything. It It's not ready yet. Yeah. And I've been at this for a long time now, and I've never written two works the same way. Um, they're different. Mm -hmm. It's different because I'm processing something in everything I'm writing, and I have a different experience of how I'm processing it. And so I've been really lucky that I 
love to teach. And I've been able to do that for my adult life. And I used to feel like I should, you know, I went through a time when I thought I should be writing while I teach. And then I thought, no, I can, I can spend my energy on this during the academic year and I can work in the summers. And there've been years when I would draft like my, my pattern in that way. And Brian, this may match up with yours as, um, is I would feel like I could do like half a draft in a summer and then go away and then come back and do half a draft the next summer <laughs> and go away and come back and do a revision of this piece. And about every third to fourth year, I could have a book. And that sort of seemed like it worked. Like that was, that was okay. That was a, that was a shape that sort of worked, but then it's really not that predictable. One of the things that I've learned is that um, the story doesn't go away just because I'm not up at five o'clock working on it, you know, um, mm -hmm. and it will. And sometimes I have to grow into it. Um, sometimes I have to write my way all the way through to figure out what the story is about. Sometimes my characters lie to me, just like I lie to me. Right. And I will have concealed what it's really about. And that is not a loss. Even if I've spent two years on it, it is the step I needed to take to find out what the truth was for this story. So like right now, I'm working on a book that um, I've drafted. Um, I haven't worked on it in a couple of years because life just hasn't let me do that. But um, but I know that the book is almost ready. I mean, and its content is ready, but I have been making fun of my character just a little bit. And I'm making fun of her because I can't bear the suffering um, of, of some of what she's dealing with. And so I pull back on it and I need to redo this book. And I don't really think any of the action is going to change. I think that's what's going to change is my distance from that character and being able to get close. That's no loss that I haven't finished it yet. So um, these are just sort of things that I've um, come to accept about that. And I'm thankful that I've had enough time and enough success that I think it doesn't matter. Like, I think that my book will probably get in the world, but my work is my day-to-day -day work, whatever that is. And sometimes that's my obligation to my dog. And sometimes that's my obligation to my wife. And sometimes that's my obligation to my students or to myself. And so then um, I just kind of try to stay in that space and trust that in time, I'll find the right shape for it. And I keep plugging along. <laughs> that's such good advice. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's really great. Actually, one of the questions I was going to ask is, um, of everybody is what kind of advice you have for, for writers that are, um, that are beginning or kind of getting the itch as writers. Maybe they just, you know, love reading and they've always wanted to write. Um, uh, that's already some incredible advice, like just yeah, letting yourself take it easy and actually live in the world um, and not beat yourself up about it. Um, what other what other advice do you all have? For the opposite of that is also true, though. I have to say, as a teacher, like there, there is that piece where, I mean, you certainly need to to do that, taking it easy and letting it come. But you mm -hmm. also um, it, you, you have to do the work. And for a young writer, you can't live in the idea of being a writer and not put in the hours. So, you know, that's also true. Yeah, absolutely. That's great advice. Yeah, well, one thing I think is, and sorry, I realize I've got very um, moody, writerly uh, lighting in my, my attic garret. Um, I was trying to make it a little brighter and I don't know that I succeeded, but I, it, we'll just call it, call it writerly. Um, I, I think the, the biggest, the biggest thing I see is that people who I think maybe have really good stories in them or poems or whatever, um, they they get too precious about the perfectness of the idea. And I'm actually a huge believer in the, like draw it to a point of completion, do a sloppy first draft, finish the thing, even though it feels bad and it feels crappy and, you know, you get it to a, a an ending point. And then I think sort of like what Sherry's saying, I think then you come back and you look at it and often then what the story is really about or what the characters are real. Oh, this was really supposed to happen. I think that then is, is revealed. But I think that uh, 
if the, the biggest thing if is just like if you can write bad stories but finish them <laughs> um then and then you can throw some of them away that i mean probably probably some people should throw more of them away but you know it's like you can you can have some bad ones and then you come back to them and you you see the shape and you sort of tighten the bolts and you twist things around but i i just think it's the finishing and so many people i, I mean i find it too it's so easy to have a an exuberant amazing beginning and then you kind of lose your your steam because it it gets it gets hard to take it somewhere i like i like that i like that i i totally relate to that i think um i would say one thing that's been really helpful to me and that's helped me to write is to find like find a community of people. And so for me, early on, I took a writing class at Writer House here in Charlottesville. A lot of communities have kind of accessible and not terribly expensive um, community writing resources. And um, but for me, doing that put me in touch with uh, my teacher ended up making a writing group, which was you know, free. <laughs> but and we, we created this writing group that we've been in for over 15 years. So that group where we meet once a month, it's just like five people. It's changed a little bit over the years. People, some of the people had MFA, some didn't, you know, children have been born, things have happened, you know, <laughs> someone leaves, someone comes. And, but having that um, group of trusted readers who are looking at work once a month or so trading around, look, you know, all of us looking at one person's work, all of us looking at another, it does a couple things. One, it, gives you that sense of audience. I think often there's a fantasy of having audience, but not of being a writer. Like being a writer is the other part. It's the making of it. But having a tiny audience, having a like a predictable audience, having the experience of kind of audience that's a little bit less of the glamorous fantasy that you have of audience is actually so much more useful. And it's kind of the same thing. It's almost it's just exciting as exciting for me to take a new thing to my writer group as to put it, you know, it's kind of the same thing, but a little bit better because I'm going to actually hear because they're trusted readers, I'm going to hear what they think um, is working, what they think, what their questions are, what they think it is. And I'm going to be able to see. And so you don't chase like what other people do necessarily. You don't necessarily like change it to meet their needs, but it lets you see what it is through someone else's yeah. eyes. And that's really exciting and fun. I mean, I think we all want to be like, seen and recognized and experienced and yes we want people to go oh that was a beautiful sentence and I or I love that idea or I'm really interested in this character but even if someone says something you know people can just say anything about it for someone to pay attention for someone to yeah. put care and pay attention to something you've made is such a gift and I think a writing group if you set it up right and if you if you do maybe invest in a class you can kind of see what good teachers do and how that should look and then you can build that little community for yourself. It can be a really useful tool. And it just is joyful. I mean, it's just a nice thing to do. Yeah, I, I love that, uh, that sentiment. Because um, I, I feel like I'm often telling um, uh, writing students and, and young writers uh, something like that. Like, you, you'll want to find a community. But I've never um, heard it explained so perfectly well exactly what it is we need. We need that sense of audience that somebody else is looking at it, taking care, you know, giving a crap about what it is we have to say. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. so incredibly helpful. Um, yeah. I want to double check uh, about any questions from the audience. If anybody uh, watching has questions um, that they want to put in the comments um, on YouTube or Facebook, um, please do. Cause we'll, maybe we'll do like one more question for everybody and see if any more, uh, if, if any questions come in from the audience. Um, during that, you know, maybe the 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 uh, idea that Chalson was just talking about, like what something of what writers need, that sense of community, uh, kind of it reminds me. Like I know we're in a state now where we're kind of acting like COVID is behind us or something like that, but I do really feel like that year or two where things were the worst they were um, really did shake things up. I mean, it shook things up for everybody. But I think it, it definitely changed something about the way writers felt and behaved because it is an odd job. It's a kind of job where you're both, on the one hand, you're kind of like lonely and working alone on a thing, but there's this other part of your life that's very social and you need 
to meet up with other people, to hear how people speak, you know, to, to be part of a society, to have that sense of kind of connection and audience with others. Um, how did you all get through that, uh, that couple of years and, and kind of keep trucking along as, as writers? Uh, Joanna first, I guess. Um, you know, I, I, I will say I would second or third everything that, that Jocelyn said about 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 just like needing an audience and and then maybe along with that too just having people who um have that shared readerly writerly and enthusiasm i mean i just think that that's something that feels so so valuable um and yeah i i throughout the pandemic i have a little group of friends here um who we we gather you know <laughs> sometimes it's it's more um writerly flavored socializing to be honest but i still feel like it's it still feels really valuable to be around people who share this this love and this interest and so you know throughout we would we would gather outside and we would go to uh one one of our friends backyards and and that was really nice in the very very beginning i did a few little trades with um some other local writers on on email which it's like a little a little less satisfying but it's still it still it still gave me something and um yeah maybe this goes back to the the like you just need that little sense of of audience and enthusiasm i will say that i sometimes with uh my brothers one of my brothers in particular He's sort of like my enthusiasm reader. And so sometimes I just need someone to not really give me too much actual feedback, but to just for me to send it and for me to know that somebody is going to read it and to give me sort of like a excited and curious response about something. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of what I did throughout the early parts of the pandemic. Yeah, Sherry, how did you how did you get through that? Well, you know, the truth is, I didn't uh, during the pandemic. I was the department chair of the English department at ODU, and mm -hmm. I was so busy because we were trying to move all those classes online, and I was really doing more to try to keep things moving and to try to keep communities intact which mm -hmm. didn't always happen, but we but it happened the best that we could. So you know, I was trying to figure out how do we run a literary festival during a pandemic? Can we have any of the events here? Um, can we have the reading? Can we have our graduate students do their reading? Can we do that outside? So it was a lot of management for me and I wasn't doing a whole lot of writing. But I did during that time um, bring out Tender Grave. And one of the things that was just uh, this was very different for me, Tender Grave, I published with Bywater Books, a lesbian press. And it was the first time I'd published a book with Bywater. And it was a very, very different experience from anything that I had done before. And one of the things about it that was so special was the community of that group of writers. Um, I ended up having such um I had incredible um, editors that that gave me feedback that kind of like the one woman who who edited my book. I'm like, God, this is like therapy. Like I have to look. <laughs> at this. She would find moves that I did in my writing that were like because I would get uncomfortable and I would try to get out of a scene. And she's like, uh, uh, right there, right there. And I'm like, whoa, OK. And so there was a lot of um, connection and a lot of um authenticity. And then this group of women at Bywater, you know, they, they would cheer on each other's books. They would um, cheer on each other's reviews. They had nicknames for one another. At first I'd be like, whoa, this is so different. But I found that to be just a tremendous gift during, and I think partly because in the pandemic, I mean, I'm a little bit of a, I'm an, I, I am an introvert and a nerd and also just kind of like want to be like, I'm kind of off on the side and it's hard for me to be public. And so they seemed a little close for me at first, but I came to really love that. And I think that that was a gift, especially because of the pandemic. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah Jocelyn, um, how did you get through the weather, the storm in the last couple of years? Yeah, it was so strange because this really hard and unprecedented thing of the pandemic kind of went along with this, lifetime goal of publishing a book, you know, which I'd, you know, I'd, I'd been writing forever. And then I'd been writing with like an age, like 
with the purpose of publishing, even though I knew that publishing wasn't going to be like a panacea and solve everything. It just was like, it felt like that purpose would allow me to make something more interesting, like to try to focus on this thing and to find partners and so forth. And I've had like, so I had, I've had three agents, like my first agent, I had a book. So over like 15 years, I had a book with one agent that didn't sell. Then I had another book with another agent that went out and like all the processes and it didn't sell. And then I was on this book. Um, so this was like a big, in a way, it was like a huge thing. So I was like, oh, I'm finally going to write a book that's going to be published and be in the world and what will happen. But in another way, I was like, this book could have just as easily not sold, like in a way. In other words, I guess I realized like how, um, how capricious the world is and how you, just things have to line up and it's not all entirely about you and not that this yeah. book isn't better or different than the other books but just you know these things come together sometimes and you can't control all the things <laughs> so by this time I was a lot more realistic about it um and so this dream thing was happening while the whole world was shutting down and then the book came out you know and I was in my and my, I'm in my parents' basement now in their little studio. And like, I'm like, my book is launching from my parents' basement. <laughs> it feels very teenagery. Um, but I, um, like uh, Sherry, I'm also an introvert. And so there's some good to that, right? You have some control to things. And I think what really saved me has nothing to do with writing during this time was just I this group of friends that I've had forever. We just started watching this incredibly cheesy show called The Shadow Hunters, And we watched it every Thursday night during the pandemic. And we like, and we still meet every Thursday night and watch something. And we just kind of, it's just this small group of people and just this one ritual once a week of being in the world and being with these people and, and, and focusing on something kind of um, light and just kind of fun and kind of um, campy and over the top and this kind of thing. It's been really like a, a gift. And I like, I'm very appreciative of those particular people in my life. <laughs> so that's really helpful. Basically, you just need to find like your people, some people, some people you love. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's turning into kind of a theme for our, our conversation. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing occurred to me uh, earlier, I think it was when Joanna was, was talking, I got uh, it, something clicked in my head. Um, the, the kind of big picture question um, of what, what do we think fiction is for? I mean, um, we, we, we all write fiction. It's very important to us. Um, it also seems very political out in the world. There's the, we're going through another uh, uh, period in America where books are being banned because of the kind of content that, that uh, some people don't like to see in, in, in their fiction um, and in their, and in their nonfiction. Um, what do we think, what do we think fiction is for? What, do, what are we up to here? Does anybody want to venture like how they feel about what this is all about? Why yeah, you? yeah. I mean, there's nothing like it, right? I mean, fiction lets us understand people and places and situations that we haven't experienced and helps us to empathize with people who are different um, than we are. I I've been teaching Toni Morrison's Beloved for the past three weeks. And one of the things that we were just talking about today is the fact that um, we all know we've we've studied slavery all our lives. Everybody knows slavery is bad. We've we've but you don't feel it. In the same way until you're, you know, with Paul D and Setha in the after effects and th that that you get these stories, these very particular concrete details that make you go, oh, my God, I had no idea, even though we had all the idea. But we had it as a concept. It wasn't in the body. And I think that that's what fiction can do is, is make you um, experience and then be capable of understanding and loving somebody different from you and um, and uh, finding peace with things you never thought you could. Yeah, I, I'm I'm convicted. I'm a I'm a prophet for fiction. <laughs> That's so great. So well said, too. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Uh, Joanna? I, I can't I can't disagree with that. I mean, and, and maybe, you know, maybe maybe coming from the space of poetry, which at, at at times had really started to feel a little too private and um, high art and and kind of like you were sort of trying to interpret someone's private 
dream. I, I do still very much think that that pleasure and entertainment is is really a part of fiction that I love. And and then I think that that's exactly right. And I think, you know, whatever literary fiction means, we all, we, we know it when we read it, but um, I realize it's sort of like, what, what does that mean? I, I do think that with literary fiction in particular, fiction that is um, concerned with interiority and trying to understand people and, you know, to go back to what Sherry was saying in the beginning, you know, what's more interesting than to try and get into a situation that would on the face of it seem appalling. How could a person make that choice? How could we, you know, have nothing but disdain for this person? Oh, you know, and, and really complicates it. It complicates it because it, it, it brings us into this situation and all of a sudden there are all these other angles. Um, and I, you know, I've seen, I'm sure y'all have seen this too, that it was some headline, like, you know, those, those who read literary fiction do have, higher levels of empathy or something to that effect. Don't quote me on it, but, um, but yeah, I think all of the above. And then I love um, Sherry, what you said, the kind of, well, there's just nothing like it. Like when, when it's done well, chef's kiss, like what, 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 what better is there? I, I, I totally um, agree. And I was just, when I talked to these high schoolers, I was kind of talking about the kind of extolling the, beauty of outsider fiction and what it does for us. And I think that how it feels piece is huge, right? So a big part of writing for me, like my Monticello was cap encapsulating how those moments felt, not just what it was or what happened or what you were going to do externally, although there is external action in the book, but like just how it feels to sit with the discomfort of slavery and history and our ancestors and all the things and in the moment and what, when we have, when we're called to do something, when we have to respond to something that there's not really a good, easy answer. Um, and I think I really also loved Sherry, what you said about um, it allows us to identify and empathize and, and indeed love, right? So getting past just those other things, someone different than us, but I also think it complicates our view of ourselves. So I think one thing, at least for me is I can read about I have a way of reading about people or hearing about people who do things that I totally disagree with and I don't feel as separate from them. And I think that's partly through my habit of reading because I don't think those people could condone slavery and that makes that kind of person or that person a bad person. I think, what are the things I do right now today that cause suffering in the world? And there are many, <laughs> the phone that I'm holding, the things around me, the comforts that I have. Um, and I don't, um, I have to look at it. I don't know. I just think it's interesting. I think it can complicate your sense of your own morality and your own self. And so I think that's a huge benefit to not just think of the other, but to realize you are the other and you are um, connected to all that complication and you're complicit to all the things as well. And I think if you do it right, that something fiction can help you to access really well said um all such such incredibly thoughtful answers um uh and such a great conversation all around i guess we should probably um wrap it up i think scott was about to to reappear to um uh to to ship us off um for the night uh, but it's been it's been such a joy to talk to all three of you i just uh, like i said at the beginning i just love love these books um incredible work yeah, thank you. This was really fascinating. Um, I enjoyed every moment of it and really loved hearing what you were saying about your work, about your books, about fiction. Um, it's it's just great. So thank you so much for doing this, Brian. Thank you so much for moderating. Um, just a couple more things before we leave. Um, the next uh, virtual panel is going to be our poetry panel on October 6th with finalists Sandra Beasley, Rita Dove, and Tina Parker. Um, and that will be moderated by a Virginia author and executive director of JMU's Furious Flower Poetry Center, Lauren K. Eileen. Um, and then join us on October 15th for the Literary Awards Celebration, where we find out um, all the amazing winners that evening. Um, it really is a fantastic event if you've never been. Um, and if you are looking for a full schedule of all the events, virtual panels, um, COTS Award um, event, everything that we do around the literary awards over the course of the September and October, uh, you can go to lva.virginia.gov slash public 
slash lit awards. Um, and if you can't find that, just search Library of Virginia Literary Awards, and I promise you'll get there. Uh, well, thank you so much to everyone. I hope everybody has a fantastic evening and uh, take care. Uh, avoid, avoid the hurricane if you can. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.